Scripture reading this morning will be in Luke chapter 19. We'll be reading verses 28 through 40. Uh, Go ahead and remain seated. I'll read these for us. Luke 19, beginning in verse 28. When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany on the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Father, I pray that you would help us now as we study your word, give us insight, give us wisdom, uh, help us to learn what it is to have a steadfast faith, a committed faith in following our Savior. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. There's a common story that is told by uh, many today who at one time in their life professed faith in Jesus, but now are completely uninterested in God at all. And though the details are different for different people, the overall story is the same. It goes something like this. A friend or relative invites them to church. Uh, They show up, not really sure what to expect, but primarily they just went to appease the person who invited them. Uh, They walk in the doors of the church for the first time in their life, and immediately they find themselves among some of the kindest people they've ever met. They're welcomed with a smile and made to feel at home. And these church people seem to be pretty much normal, which kind of catches them off guard a a bit. Then the service begins, and while the music may seem a bit strange at first, the sermon is convicting and powerful and yet somehow simultaneously comforting. They hear about Jesus and how he died for their sins and how he offers them new life. They hear the invitation of the preacher to to turn from their sins and become a follower of Jesus. And in their heart, they feel a sense of hope, hope that their life can change. Their marriage can be improved. They can experience love and community with others. They can have new meaning and purpose in their life. And so they decide they're going to give this Christianity thing a try. They start attending church every week, getting involved in whatever ministries or Bible study groups there may be, and everything's going great. Now They're even reading the Bible on their own now. They're learning to pray. And there's a certain excitement and hope in the heart of a new convert like this. But then as time passes, tragedy strikes. It may be that the marriage falls apart, a child dies, a job is lost, a frightening diagnosis is given, a sick loved one whom the whole church had been praying for dies, and all of a sudden that excitement is gone. They can't understand why would God allow something like this to happen. The Bible that they once read sits on the table untouched day after day. Church attendance becomes hit or miss. And pretty soon, they just move on with their life and leave Jesus in the shadows. This story is very common. When you talk to someone like this about their faith, they'll often say something like this. You know, I I tried that whole Christianity thing, and it helped me for a while. I know it works for some people, and if it works for you, that's great. But for me, it's just not where I'm at right now. That's a story that I have been told many, many times. Again, the details vary somewhat. But the end result is that this person has become disillusioned with God and Christianity because of some tragedy or unanswered prayer. And so they're no longer interested in God. Maybe they even begin to question if any of it is real. Now let's step back and ask, why did their faith fail? Uh, What caused this person, this this proverbial person who really represents many in America today, what would cause them to abandon Christianity like this? And I would suggest, among other things, perhaps two faulty assumptions, underlying assumptions that were present in their mind, though perhaps the person in question wasn't really even aware of them. Uh, First, a person like this often sees spiritual truth as something personal and subjective rather than objective and absolutely true. 
So in other words, if Jesus makes you feel better and if being a Christian uh, works for you, then it's true. That's the first faulty assumption that many have, is if spiritual truth is just subjective and personal. Second, many people like this view their spiritual happiness, I'm sorry, their personal happiness as the goal in life. And the reason to be a Christian is really in pursuit of that goal. So if Jesus is going to make me a happier person with a better life, if he can fix my marriage, if he can help me with my addiction, if he can heal my loved ones, then sure, I'll be a Christian. That's often the unspoken objective of many who uh, start attending church. Instead of seeing yourself as existing for the glory of God to serve and worship him, basically the idea is that Jesus should help me. It's like a good luck charm to go to church each Sunday. And if I read my Bible and pray every day, now God really has to help me out in life. Now, what does any of this have to do with Luke 19? Well, you're going to have to wait a little while uh, toward the end of the sermon to find that out. But those two faulty assumptions, uh, keep those in mind because we're going to return to them later. Our text here in Luke 19 records the events that took place in what is commonly referred to as Palm Sunday. There's some debate as to whether it was Sunday or Monday. Uh, that's the type of debate I don't really care much about, but I'll just give that to you. Uh, this is the occasion in which Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the prophet Zechariah had spoken of this moment when the Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Uh, he said this centuries before it took place. In Zechariah 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Uh, this, this was a passage that brought comfort to the Jews. They believed that this coming king would enter the city of Jerusalem and deliver them from their enemies. Uh, they took that line about having salvation as meaning deliverance from the Roman uh, army that was occupying their land. And so when we get to Luke 19, we have to understand what all of this excitement is about. Uh, if you're reading the story for the first time, you might be wondering, why are they freaking out about him entering into uh, the city of Jerusalem? But when they see Jesus... Uh, entering the city, riding on a donkey, being hailed as king, they're thinking that this was the moment they had been waiting for. The Messiah was here. He was going to overthrow the Romans and give Israel back their freedom. And this anticipation is why the crowds were rejoicing at Jesus' arrival. We're going to pick up the text in verse 28 where we read, When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went, went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Now, just as a side note, this may have been a prearranged plan that was set in motion by Jesus. And so the phrase, the Lord has need of it, perhaps was a password of sorts. Uh, so the owner would know that this was the people Jesus had sent. Uh, another possibility is that this is simply a display of Jesus' omniscience, that without ever meeting this man, Jesus knew that he would find this colt tied and he knew that the owner would be satisfied if he knew that Jesus needed it. Either way, uh, they find the colt just as Jesus said. And verse 35 says they bring it to Jesus, uh, throwing their cloaks on the colt. They set Jesus on it. As he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And John's account adds that they also cut down some branches from palm trees that were around and spread those on the road, which is how Palm Sunday gets its name. Verse 37, as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. And glory in the highest. Here they're quoting from Psalm 118. Uh, clearly they understood Jesus to be the long-awaited Messiah, and they expected that he would reign as king and give them peace from their enemies. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, as we've seen, was the fulfillment of prophecy. It's also the culmination of this long journey that we've been on in the book of Luke uh, toward the city of Jerusalem. Remember back in chapter 9, uh, Jesus and his followers leave Galilee, they set out for Jerusalem, and now they've finally arrived. In addition to this, it's also a proclamation of his identity as Messiah. By entering the city on a donkey and allowing the people to welcome him with these words, 
Jesus is publicly proclaiming that he is the long-awaited king who has come to save them. Now here's something that perhaps would surprise you if you don't already know. Uh, this event takes place on Sunday. Uh, Jesus will be killed on Friday of the same week. And the reason that may come as a surprise is it seems like the crowds, the people, are all on his side. Uh, they're cheering, they're praising God for sending the Messiah to them. They're putting their clothes and palm branches on the ground before them, sort of like uh, rolling out the red carpet as the king comes in. And yet these same crowds will be calling for his blood in five days. These who, who are today saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. In less than a week, they will be saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Crucify him. Incredible. What on earth would have caused this sudden turn against Jesus? How could people so enthusiastically welcome him, but then turn on him in such a short period of time? Well, the answer lies in the text that we looked at last week. Uh, this is one reason that I insist on preaching through books of the Bible in order, because if you study one text without studying the paragraph before it, you often miss a key point that would help explain what comes later. If you were with us last Sunday, you remember we looked at the parable of the ten minas. And the stated reason for the parable is provided for us in Luke 19, verse 11, which says, As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. The crowds of people with Jesus assumed that the kingdom was going to come right now. The king would enter Jerusalem, he would rally an army of Jews and fight off the Romans. Uh, they viewed the Messiah primarily as a military figure, someone who would destroy Israel, Israel's enemies and then establish his kingdom. And they thought that this was going to happen now, immediately. Jesus told this parable to clarify that they were mistaken. He was not here to receive his throne now. Rather, he would be leaving for a time and would receive the kingdom at his second coming. That's the point of the parable, verses 12 through 27 that we looked at last week. Uh, the man leaves and then he returns after some time has passed and then reigns as king. But the people listening to Jesus apparently didn't get it. They're still thinking uh, that this is all about deliverance from Rome. They are expecting this rebellion against the Romans to begin now. In fact, Mark's account of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem records that some of them were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. You can see what their focus is on. Uh, they think that this is their moment. And they missed the point of the parable entirely. They were still expecting the kingdom to come immediately. But of course, Jesus wasn't there to fight. He was there to die. Jesus didn't come riding into Jerusalem on a war horse. He instead came riding humbly on a young donkey. And this faulty assumption is what led the people to reject Jesus and turn on him so quickly. Because they weren't really following Jesus with a committed faith. They were following him because they thought he could save them from their enemies. If Jesus is here to overthrow Rome, then sure, I'll cast my vote in with him. But as soon as that expectation wasn't met, they turned on him. They were only on Jesus' side as long as he was doing for them what they wanted. They had a faulty view of spiritual truth. They had a faulty assumption of what following Jesus would mean for them. It wouldn't mean victory and freedom from Rome. It would mean, in many cases, death. And a fickle faith like these people displayed won't endure times of suffering and persecution. Now here we are 2,000 years later looking back on them with our judgmental self-righteousness. But let's be honest, we don't have any governments occupying our land right now, demanding that we pay taxes and all the rest. And while our circumstances today are very different than those in which the people of Jerusalem faced, the problem of shallow, superficial faith is just as prevalent today as it was then. Remember the story that I started with. So many people are willing to follow Jesus as long as he is meeting their expectations and helping them with their problems. We really aren't that different from the crowds in Jerusalem. We welcome Jesus into our life because of selfish reasons. And as soon as difficult times come and our faith doesn't seem to be working, we abandon it. This crowd in Jerusalem is very much like the shallow soil from the parable of the soils back in Mark 4. Listen to this parable that Jesus gives and the explanation that follows. Beginning in verse 1, it says, He began to teach beside the sea. A very large crowd gathered around him, so he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. 
And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky soil, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. When the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. Later, when he was alone, the disciples asked Jesus what this parable meant, and he gives the following explanation. He tells them that this is about people who hear the word of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus, and how they respond to it. Verse 14 says, The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. They, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. In other words, they just don't even understand the gospel. They hear it, but it never sinks in. Verse 16, these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. Now, this is the type of person we talked about at the beginning. Uh, just like the people in Jerusalem, this is the person who hears about Jesus and immediately and enthusiastically responds to this news with joy. They're excited to follow Christ, shouting, praising God. And then verse 17, they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. When things don't go the way that they expected, when things become difficult, they turn their back on Jesus. Verse 18, others are the ones sown among thorns. These are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Now, this would be someone like the rich young ruler that we studied a few weeks ago. Someone who had an interest in Jesus, but was unwilling to give up control of his life, and in his case of his wealth, in order to follow Christ. Verse 20, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. These are the truly committed followers of Christ, men like Zacchaeus, who were willing to follow him even if it was going to cost them. So what's the point of all this? Uh, really, the question is, what kind of soil are you? Or to ask it another way, what kind of faith do you have? Committed faith or fickle faith? Are you here today in church because of some perceived benefit that you might receive? Or are you here today because you have committed your life in service to Jesus? We ought to follow Jesus because he is Lord, not because of what he can do for us. Now, I'm not suggesting that following Christ cannot improve your life at all. Of course, Christianity has helped many people with their marriage. It's helped parents to raise their children well. Following Christ brings joy and purpose to your life. And God can and does answer prayer, not at all intending to suggest otherwise. Those are benefits that often come as one becomes a, a Christian, but those should never be the basis of our faith. If you're a Christian because you want God to fix your life or answer your prayers or some other self-centered reason, those are flimsy reasons to follow Jesus. That kind of self-centered interest in God won't last through trials, because as soon as he fails to meet your expectations, you'll have lost the foundation of your faith. When tragedy comes into your life, or when prayers go unanswered, or when God allows something to happen that you just can't understand, in that moment, you will either turn your back on him or run to him. You'll either remain a committed follower or you'll abandon him. And what will determine your response is the nature of your faith. Why are you a Christian? Why do you follow Christ? Now, the reason that we ought to follow Christ isn't subjective. It's not based on whether we have a warm, fuzzy feeling or not. It's the objective facts of who he is. The reason to follow Jesus has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. He is the God who made us. He is the Lord who is sovereign over all things. He is the king to whom we must submit. He is the savior who can free us from our sins and give us forgiveness and eternal life through him. And he is the only one who can. Those are objective facts that will never change. And they should be the foundation of our commitment to him. Not some subjective feeling or self-interest in how he might improve my life. No matter what happens in your life or mine, those truths about Christ and who he is will never change. 
And so if that is the foundation of your faith, your faith will stand in the midst of trials. Well, as I said, we are very near the end now. In the weeks to come, we will see the religious leaders of Jerusalem plotting to kill Jesus. The crowds will turn on him and demand his death. And even his closest followers will abandon him in fear. There are very dark days ahead in the coming chapters. And this triumphal entry into Jerusalem is sort of like the last high point of his ministry. Of course, it's very shallow. It's not as genuine as we would like, but it is sort of the last hint of of popularity that Jesus has. Very soon, the tides will turn. And even here, there is a hint of the hostility that Jesus will soon face. This spectacle of the crowd shouting and rejoicing, praising God, it enraged those who opposed Jesus. And so in verse 39, we're told that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to stop. This was an outrage to them. They refused to even consider if perhaps the crowd was right, and this was the Messiah. The Pharisees stood absolutely opposed to Jesus, even at this high point in his popularity with the rest of the people. Verse 40, Jesus answers them, I tell you, if these, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And so our text ends with this sign of what's to come. The hostility against Jesus will intensify in the coming few days until finally they will make their move to have Jesus arrested and killed. And that did not fit the expectations of the Jews at all. They expected the king to destroy their enemies and reign in Jerusalem. And instead he died at the enemy's hands. Yet this was the very means by which God would provide salvation. 